Now on BBC Radio 4, it's time for Woman's Hour with Jane Garvey. A very good morning to you. Welcome to what promises to be a truly fantastic week with us here on Woman's Hour. We're continuing with our game-changing theme throughout the week, and that means the Woman's Hour takeover is finally upon you and us. Each programme this week is in the hands of a brilliant woman. Dame Kelly Holmes, the novelist Naomi Alderman, Baroness Doreen Lawrence and Lauren Laverne will all guest edit Woman's Hour this week. Make our guest editors please um, feel welcome. You can take part on Twitter. You using the hashtag WHTakeover. I know a lot of you are already busy at that right now. We appreciate it. So on Twitter, take part, please. Hashtag WHTakeover. We start the week then with one of the most successful authors Britain has ever produced, J.K. Rowling. She's chosen the topics we're talking about today. The huge numbers of children living in institutions all over the world, women in rugby and the power of the shoe. All that later. Uh, excited? We are. So let's get going. Joe, welcome. It's fantastic that you're doing this with us here at Woman's Hour as part of our Woman's Hour takeover. You are starting the whole week of guest editors, so no pressure at all. Uh, tell us what you really want to bring to the whole thing. Or well, lots of things. I thought it was such an exciting opportunity to talk about some things I really care about. You've just made me feel quite pressured, <laughs> saying I'm kicking it off. I hope it's a good programme. Well, I'm going to try. I mean, the programme started in 1946. It's never had a guest editor before. <gasps> Are you serious? I, I didn't know that. absolutely serious. OK, now I'm a bit terrified. But I don't think you need to be, because I think they'll really want to hear what you've got to say and what you're interested in. So, apart from being appreciative of the hours you've given them because their children have been too busy reading you I think they'll really want to hear what you've got to say and what you're interested in now Joe, um the subject of multiple sclerosis is of huge importance to you because mm -hmm. of your late mother um, tell me a little bit about her well she was a very young mother just 20 when she had me very poignant to look back on that because of all my friends would say oh your mum's so young she would chat away to us like a friend I suppose she she always seemed very young she was very fit she's non-smoker non-drinker and I say all of this because of course then for her to be diagnosed at 35 with an illness that would kill her was just the most enormous shock she did have a very aggressive form of multiple sclerosis and I I always make a point of saying that because I wouldn't want anyone listening to this program if they've been recently diagnosed to think that that's the inevitable outcome. It's certainly not. I've certainly met a lot of people who've lived with the condition for many decades. So I, you know, I just reinforces how very unlucky my mother was. She was obviously desperately unlucky. You were just a teenage girl. Teenage mm -hmm. girls are not the easiest people. <laughs> uh, oh, no, I, I was angelic. <laughs> well, with the exception, and, and I was as well, coincidentally. Yes, I'm sure you were. Uh, but but what, what sort of an impact did that have on your teenage years? Did it change you? Yes, definitely. I think that to have chronic illness in the family always changes the dynamic of the family. Guilt and worry, anxiety enter your life. And my mother, by the time she was diagnosed, she was quite ill. So it wasn't just the spectre of the unknown, it was the dealing with the daily reality of somebody who's starting not to be able to walk as well as they had. And um, for such an active person, that was a real privation. What breaks my heart, actually, just as an obvious outsider to all this, is just that your mum doesn't know about you and about what's happened to you. That's just almost unbearable, actually. I do think about that a lot inevitably because of everyone I mean thankfully I still have my sister I'm very close to my sister and, and Di is a great source of comfort obviously mm. but um, my mother was a passionate reader she would have been excited whatever I did if I succeeded at anything but particularly to be a writer she would have considered to be a very valuable thing is that how you remember her I don't know sit sitting in a chair reading just sort of being content with that definitely she would retreat into a book often. The, and the other thing I very vividly remember is her laugh. My sister and I still, to this day, have never met anyone with such a contagious laugh as my mother. She sounded like she was suffocating, which doesn't sound, which doesn't <laughs> doesn't sound, sound great. That, doesn't sound that attractive, but it was really contagious because you wondered whether she was actually going to be able to draw breath at any point. So, yeah, I do remember that. Well, now you, you have the, the Anne Rowling Clinic. Tell us a little bit about that. 
Well, it's part of the University of Edinburgh who came to me with a proposal specifically for neuroregeneration. And it's a very underfunded area, or traditionally it has been. I don't even know what it means, I'm afraid. What, what is that? Well, they used to believe that nerves couldn't regenerate. They used to think that once you had nerve damage, that was it. Now we believe that you can halt the damage and you can repair nerve damage. So that's what they were really looking to do, to have a dedicated clinic for this, this area of research. I thought it was the best proposal I'd ever seen. And you can imagine I get all sorts of proposals for me to invest in charity-wise. And the other big thing was MS is a particularly Scottish disease. So it felt right that the project was funded here in Edinburgh in the capital. And it means that Scottish people will get the chance to participate in trials and so on, which I think is, is going to give a lot of people a lot of hope. Well, multiple sclerosis affects roughly 100,000 people in the UK and three times as many women as men will develop it. Scotland has the highest incidence of MS in the world. I spoke to Professor Charles French Constant of the Centre for Regenerative Medicine at the University of Edinburgh about why Scottish women are more at risk and also to the BBC journalist Elizabeth Quigley who has MS. I asked Elizabeth how she was diagnosed 14 years ago. I was 28. I just started a job with BBC Scotland as their political correspondent. I was working hard, I was very busy, and I had a very strange tingling down one side of my face. really thought it was a bit of a... Well, it wasn't a pain, it was a kind of distraction from what I really wanted to be getting on with. I put off doing anything about it for a while and then I got in touch with my GP feeling a complete fraud. Like, what am I doing here bothering you with something really as simple as a slight tingle in my face? I asked what on earth could it be and he, I now realise, knew exactly what it was. And he said, oh, I think you should go for an MRI scan. And I went along for that. Again, thinking I'd wasted everybody's time. The neurologist at that time said to me, ah, yes, it's an inflammation of the nerves, as we had thought. And there's me, again, thinking I'm wasting NHS time, saying, oh, inflammation of the nerves, right, that's fine. What's that? And the neurologist saying to me, well, another name for it is uh, MS. And that was a bit of a shock because I knew nothing about MS. The main question to me was, why? Not why me? I mean, it could be anybody, so why not me? Why is it happening to me as a Scot? Can I ask that question then of Charles? What is the link, as far as we understand it, between the Scottish population, particularly Scottish women, and prevalence of MS? That's a difficult question to answer because, we, of course, we don't understand the cause of MS, but there, there's three things we do know. Firstly, it's more common in women than it is in men. This is a feature of a number of diseases like MS where cells of the immune system behave abnormally and attack different parts of the body. The second thing is we know that there is a genetic component to the risk and we know that in the Scottish population there are genes thought to have originally come from the Vikings which increase the risk to MS. But they don't make you have MS and, and we know that because if you take identical twins with multiple sclerosis even though somebody who is the twin of someone who has MS has exactly the same genes they only have a 30% chance of getting the condition so that means there's something else and one of the things we know is very important is latitude the distance you live from the equator the more that distance is, the greater your risk of developing MS. Why that is, is a subject of much research. I mean, vitamin D and sunlight are, would be an obvious possible cause in, into which there's a lot of research. So if you put all that together, you have a genetic predisposition and the distance from the equator, you get a significantly increased risk. The rate in the south of England, for example, is about 1 in 900, but in Edinburgh it's 1 in 700, and in Aberdeen it's 1 in 500. So it, it's getting significantly more common up here. Joe Rowling's mother had a really very aggressive form of MS. Um, tell me, Charles, how 
variable the symptoms and outcomes can be? There are two components to this disease. Elizabeth described very clearly what happens when the immune cells enter the brain and attack the myelin, this insulation around the nerve fibres. You get inflammation that you can see on an MRI scan and that causes the nerve fibres not to work properly. But in the longer term, as the myelin becomes progressively more damaged, the nerve fibres themselves stop working properly and, and will actually degenerate. And this causes what we call progression, where, where people become increasingly disabled. Now, what is variable is the extent to which an individual person will have relapses and remissions before they become progressive and how long it takes before they start to become progressive. And that variation is a big problem for neurologists, of course, because it means that um, when a neurologist sees somebody in the clinic very early on, he or she can't really tell how severe that person's MS is going to be and so that makes it more difficult to plan what sort of drug therapy you're going to use. If for neurologists it's frustrating, for patients it is infuriating and frustrating because we're living with this every day and we don't know what's going to happen next. It used to be the case, I know, that women with MS were advised not to consider pregnancy but uh, brilliantly Elizabeth you've had a son and uh, your pregnancy was all right, wasn't it? Um, I had was starting to have real problems walking. So I was starting to walk with a stick. Um, my writing had disappeared. I had a tremor in my hand. Typing was just impossible. I became pregnant and then the symptoms seemed to disappear. Very strange. My walking was much improved. I could write again. I could type again. How very strange that this strange occurrence happened when I was pregnant. Charles, what's that then? What was going on? What happens during pregnancy, of course, is that the immune system is suppressed because the woman is carrying a, a baby that would otherwise be attacked by the immune system. And so the MS activity reduces dramatically during pregnancy as a result of that overall suppression of the immune system, but usually kicks in again once the baby's been delivered and the immune system becomes active again. Every lady person is now screaming at the radio well the answer is obviously to fill everybody with MS full of uh, feel-good pregnancy hormones and there it is there's your solution but it, it obviously isn't that simple is it or to fill everyone with MS with very powerful immunosuppressive drugs and those drugs are available but like any powerful drug they have powerful side effects mm. patients can die of, of the side effects so it's really very important that you only use those drugs in the patients who really need them which comes back straight away to the problem we've already talked about of variability without knowing what somebody is going to be like in a few years time it's difficult to make the informed decisions about drug therapies and the focus of your research right now Charles is what the focus of our research is on progression. There are no drugs at all to deal with this problem of the nerve fibre degeneration that causes progressive disability. We're trying to find ways of recruiting the brain stem cells to make new myelin and so repair the damage that's been done. And what we've done is we've linked up our MS research with the other research going on in Edinburgh around stem cells and regenerative biology to try to push this forward as fast as possible. Being optimistic, the fact that there is this, this prevalence of MS within the Scottish population gives you a brilliant opportunity, doesn't it? If we're going to understand this disease anywhere, we'll understand it in Scotland. We've really tried to put the patients at the heart of our research effort. We've built the Anne Rowling Regenerative Neurology Clinic, which is designed to really bring care and research together into a single building. We work hard there to really understand individual patients' uh, disease and identify those that would be appropriate for the clinical trials we want to do. And for me, my MS has certainly um, changed my life, but it's not a life-halting disease. It's a life-changing one, I suppose. All the way along, I've always felt that if Scotland is the centre of the world for MS prevalence then surely Scotland can be the centre for finding the cure 
for this condition. I mean, why not turn this negative? And it is a negative. It's not an easy condition to live with. Why not turn that negative into a really powerful positive? Why can't we just find the cure or find treatments or make people's lives just a little bit better here in Scotland in order to help others to be able to cope with this condition? Why not? Well, wouldn't that be fantastic? That was the BBC journalist Elizabeth Quigley and you also heard there from Professor Charles French Constant. Now, you can find links for more information about MS on the Women's Hour website and we are going to return to the issue of women and MS on a future edition of Women's Hour. If you would like to get in touch on that subject, and I know people have already done so via Twitter, please do send us perhaps something rather longer in email form via our website. We'd really appreciate it. Now, Scottish rugby is something that many fans of J.K. Rowling will know she is pretty fanatical about. In fact, during the Six Nations, she told her followers on Twitter that wizards worldwide support the Scottish rugby team. It's an old, magical tradition. Well, wizardly support didn't clinch the Six Nations for Scotland, but it hasn't stopped Joe Rowling choosing rugby as one of her topics in her Woman's Hour takeover. I've got to be honest, Joe. I am uh, very much a, a football woman. Absolutely oh, love football. That's interesting. Um, you'll, you'll need you'll need to convert me to rugby union. So well, on you go. Here you go, because I also was a football woman. I grew up in a house where my father and my male relatives were all football supporters and I was used to watching football on the TV and I do enjoy watching football on the television. It's not until I married a Scot that um, I was taken, (laughs) not entirely willingly at first, to the rugby and then I accidentally um, ended up enjoying the rugby and getting quite interested in the rugby so um, there is hope for you you can definitely you can uh, definitely convert yeah uh-huh. maybe yes and I will say this I was staggered the first time I went to the rugby and as you can hear I, I didn't go entirely willingly that first time which was a long time ago now and I was very taken aback by the difference in a rugby crowd and a football crowd and as a woman being at the rugby it's um, it's it's quite a welcoming place whereas I can remember going to um, football matches in London and feeling quite intimidated. So that was obviously a, a welcome change. So it's a more violent game. Yeah, much more. For what's on the pitch is, is horrible and violent and dreadful. <laughs> but meanwhile, you're sitting with a lot of people who will happily buy you half a pint and a pie and chat away to you even if they're supporting the opposition. So I, th- I found that rather enjoyable. <laughs> Joe Rowling, a revelling in the thought of a pie and a pint at a game of rugby. Well, with Joe's love of Scottish rugby and the fact that exactly 20 years ago this month, Scotland played host to the Women's Rugby World Cup, we sent our reporter Rachel Devine to the Scottish rugby finals in Cumbernauld, where men's and women's matches were played. And here she is talking to Nikki Gaskell, who's scrum half for Broughton. <laughs> seem to be this kind of distinction between men and women's rugby. I mean, I know there is in terms of money and viewing figures and things, but when you talk to the men, they really seem to love the women's game as well. Yeah, I think the men that play, and especially play for clubs where there's women's teams, I think they appreciate it more because they they see us, you know, trying just as hard as them, training just as hard as them, and getting numbers down to training as well, you know, it just shows that we've got just as much dedication to the sport as, as them. And do you think that uh, as, as more women start to play the game and it gets more support, the game changes for the better? Hopefully, yeah. I mean, I think it's about getting young girls involved and, you know, the same as they do with the men. Hi, Eddie. So are you sticking around to see the women's final today? Yes, I am, yes. Rugby is open to everyone. And I think actually it's not a sexist thing, it should be for everyone. And it's nice to see the women's game shown on the same day as men's finals? Absolutely. I think actually this is uh, the platform and the foundation and I think this will become a regular occurrence. Our reporter Rachel Devine reporting there. Now, the Council and Board of Scottish Rugby Union has recently approved new proposals to try to increase the popularity of the women's game across Scotland. And Heather Lockhart can join us now. She's played 71 games for Scotland. She also sits on the SRU Championship Committee and the Women and Girls Working Party of the SRU. Heather, good morning to you. Good morning. Hi. Uh, Take us back then to your playing days back in the 90s. How has the game changed, would you say? 
I think um, I was lucky enough actually to watch the World Cup in 1994 in Edinburgh and it was a fantastic spectacle and I think now uh, 20 years later there's more and more uh, popularity worldwide for instance countries that are playing the game that you wouldn't expect for instance Kazakhstan they're going to the World Cup this year in France so it's it's very exciting times for women's rugby and um, particularly in Scotland where we've got an opportunity now to really launch women's rugby and women's rugby and girls rugby and increase its popularity our popularity and grow the game I guess you need willing and enthusiastic teachers qualified teachers as well don't you because it's not actually well we know it can be a dangerous game it's also a relatively complicated one isn't it um yeah yes and no at the end of the day um women's game and the men's game is exactly the same you've just got to score more points than the opposition from that respect totally simple you just need to win just like football just like anything else so in terms of that you've got to keep it simple and I think when when girls are learning the game I think we've got to uh, make sure that they have the basic skills catch and passing for instance other pe- uh, players coming from other sports that's how I got involved um, I used to play a lot of tennis and hockey and still do and those skills are completely transferable into rugby so basic catching and passing obviously you have to learn tackling skills contact skills and I think the girls that come to that really enjoy that aspect of it it was interesting um, Joe Rowling was talking about the violent nature of the game I, I wouldn't say it was violent in so much as just something of a challenge and, and the girls that come to it is at contact it's just part and parcel of the game and you're prepared for it and it's, n- it's not an extension of what the girls do out with it it's part of sport Well, it's great to hear the enthusiasm in your voice when you talk about it, Heather. Thank you very much for coming on Women's Hour today. Heather Lockhart, who has played 71 times for Scotland and represented them at Rugby Union. Good morning. You're listening to Women's Hour. It's WH Takeover Week this week. That's the hashtag you need if you want to take part in the ongoing debate on Twitter. And our guest editor this morning is one of the world's best known and most successful writers, J.K. Rowling. Now, the UN estimates that up to 8 million children around the world are living in care institutions. Now, they're often called orphanages or children's homes, although at least four out of five of the children living in them have one or indeed both parents living. Jo Rowling first became aware of the issue back in 2004 when she was scanning the Sunday papers. It's something she became quite passionate about and led eventually to her setting up a charity, Lumos, to tackle what she sees as a terrible problem. She told me exactly what happened when she saw that article in the Sunday Times. I was pregnant at the time with my third child, so you know you're always a little bit more emotional than you would otherwise be. And I saw a really shocking photograph of a little boy who appeared to be in a tiny cage. And to my shame... My instinctive reaction was to turn the page. I just couldn't bear the sight of it. And I I stopped myself and I said to myself, you're going to read the article and if it's as bad as it looks, then you must do something about it. So I read the article. It was 10 times worse than it looked. This little boy had uh, mental and physical difficulties and he had literally been locked in a cage. And um, that's how it started. And I, I founded a charity called Lumos. The aim is to facilitate change in countries where institutionalization is still very common. By 2008, of course you were already a huge success and and I guess you by then you had power so you say you started the charity uh, you could and and brilliantly you did but of course that's not most of us can't even though we might think we'd like to no um you're right I'm in a very privileged position and I'm 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 aware of that and I want to use my power for good and not for evil Having said that, the very first thing I did was to write letters. And I'm a great believer in in letter writing. Actually, I used to work for Amnesty International. And you can change lives just by writing a letter. So I would encourage people to get involved and to do what they can. Have you ever visited any of these institutions? I have, yes. Um, It was was very difficult. It was heartbreaking. I remember um, being introduced to a group of three-year-olds who swarmed all over me. I mean, they, they, they just gravitated to anyone who would show them affection. I had one little girl, I remember, sitting on my lap and just clinging to me, and she'd just been introduced to me. And what's I'm going quite emotional even talking about this, because what's particularly upsetting about that is we know that children are often trafficked out of institutions, and I was being given this, this terrible, glaring, obvious example of how easy that is to do any affection and these children are are, will eat out of your hands um there were other things i saw that were terribly upsetting in the same institution which were 
three children with cerebral palsy who of course over here might well be integrated into the normal education system. They spent their lives lying on a bed side by side. None of the children I'm talking about were orphans. They all had family outside. It was simply that their families just had nowhere else to go. There was no social support. There was no community-based support. Poverty is a huge reason why children end up in these institutions. More than 90% of them have either parents or living family, close family. Well, you are founder and president of of LUMOS. Just tell us something about the work that organisation does now on the ground. Many countries know that there's a problem and they... they want to work with us. So what does it mean? Sometimes it means going into the institution and assessing the children's needs. Often their needs haven't been met very effectively in the institution so we're trying to get them specialist medical care. Small group homes where if they cannot return to their families then a model that is like family-based care um, can be set up and that's, that's proven to be much more effective. Also persuading governments of the reality which is that community-based care is much cheaper and much better for the children so if they could return to their families but a proper social work system and a health care system were there to support them their outcomes are likely to be much better. Well there are indeed children living in institutions all over the world and that does perhaps surprisingly include Europe. We sent a reporter Anastasia Yuspenskaya to Moldova the poorest country in Europe with a big foreign debt and very high unemployment. Lumos put us in touch with a girl of 14 who's been helped by the charity to leave an institution and go back to her family. She spent a year living in an orphanage and vividly recalls what it was like before she went into care age 10. Mum left home because Dad was beating her badly and she couldn't stand it anymore. She didn't have any choice. Our dad also left and we, me and my two older sisters, went to live with Granny. Mum's mother. But Granny couldn't raise us on her own and had to send us to an institution. At the beginning, it was very tough. Most of all, I didn't like our mentor. She wasn't kind. Basically, I didn't like a thing there. I didn't make such close friends as to miss them. There were many bad children with bad habits and filthy language. I tried to avoid them. I didn't like the food. My grandma cooks so much better, you can't even compare. At the institution I cried every day. It's a completely different world. When I think about my grandma placing me there, I do think that maybe she could have been more patient while our case was revised by the authorities. She appealed to them, said that she had three girls to take care of and asked them for support. It took a year before the support was provided and now I think that maybe we could have survived that year without having to go anywhere. My grandma didn't visit us while we were in the institution. She only came with us when we moved there. She wanted to see what the place was like. She's not young and she's got problems with her legs. It's hard for her to walk distances. It was a very bad time in my life. I'm sure it's a bad time for all kids that end up in institutions. When I have my own children, I will never, ever give them away. Not even for one day. Not even one moment, no matter what. I will not even tell them that I, myself, had to spend time in such an institution. Well, that young girl is now back living with her grandmother. She did get him back, back in touch recently with her mother and uh, is saying that she would like to live with her again one day. Well, in 2006, the government of Moldova launched a reform of the children's residential care system, proposing to reduce by half the number of its children living in residential institutions by 2012. Well, it appears that progress has been made, but according to UNICEF, official data lacks specific information about gender and disabilities. Well, we talked to Frauke de Court, who's Chief Child Protection Officer for UNICEF in Moldova. She's been to three different institutions there in the last six months. We asked her what conditions were like. The ones that are in a city environment, they do have running water, they do have uh, indoor toilets. The physical conditions are fairly good. But uh, when you go to the rural areas where also some of my UNICEF colleagues have visited, the situation is very different. Some of the institutions there in rural areas don't have running water, they don't have indoor toilets. But what all these institutions have in common is that there is not much time and scope and awareness of how to deal with emotional development of children. There is not one-on-one care. When you see research about, for instance, brain scans of children who have grown up in a loving, caring environment with full stimulation, 
And you compare that to children from institutions or children who have been emotionally neglected, you can even see that their brain is much smaller. In addition, children are not being taught any life skills, and by that I mean they are often removed from the community and from society and from everyday life. They don't have any concept about money or what things cost. They don't know how public transport works. So when they leave the institutions as adults or young adolescents, they can't really cope. Moreover, because the institutions are not supporting them and keeping in touch with the biological families, they really don't have anywhere to go. So that's where you see that many of these children as adults will also be poor, unemployed, or end up in trafficking or in conflict with the law. The big number of children in institutions are still a legacy of, of the Soviet era, where the state was responsible for people. They didn't have their personal responsibility. So many specialists, but also parents who were poor, who were single parents, or when the child had a disability, they really thought that it would be better for the child to be an institution. They thought the care, the education, the health facilities, the living environment would be better than at home. And they really thought they did their child a favor for a better future. Since 2006, the government has done a lot, but there is a lot that remains to be done. The government has to finance services at the community level that enables parents to care for their own children. Poverty should never be a reason for a family not to look after their own children. There also needs to be more effort in making schools more inclusive of children with the special needs because many of the kids in institutions are children with disabilities. So that would enable parents to keep their children at home and children to have a good education at the same time. There is also a need for those children that cannot go back to their biological parents to be placed in foster care services. Well, that's Frauke de Kort, who works for UNICEF in Moldova. Now, we also spoke to Valentina Boliga, who's Minister of Labour, Social Protection and Family in Moldova. Uh, why then does that country still have so many children living in institutions? <laughs> The migration of parents abroad, poverty, broken families, all these make for high numbers of Moldovan children in need of alternative care. We recently commissioned a survey which says that around 105,000 children in Moldova have one or both parents living and searching for work abroad. According to official figures, 600,000 Moldovans are away. And this is one of the causes of that large number of children in need of care that you have mentioned. And with lots of regrets, I have to say that we still had, at the beginning of this year, 3,808 children in residential institutions. Well, UNICEF say that the standards of institutions vary according to where they're situated, whether it's in a city or in the countryside. Uh, surely that can't be acceptable. Noi avem un standard de minime de calitate pentru fiecare serviciu aprobat. We have minimum standards of quality for each service. Our teams of specialists are trained and carefully taught new abilities. It's difficult for me to say where the UNICEF got this information from. I won't exclude the possibility that they found out that we offer more services in the cities, but things are changing. Now we've got day centers, we've got community centers, even in villages. This year, we've introduced a mechanism to certify all these care units, and this will bring more order into the system because we want quality for our children be it in a village be it in a city well what about the lack of life skills how well are these children being prepared for life when they leave care I agree that the burden of having been put into a residential care institution may be carried by children throughout their lives. But now we have introduced in their curriculum such skills that have to do with managing daily life tasks. 
but I won't exclude the possibility of individual cases. They concern us and motivate us to make sure the children are really educated as to how to behave and how to be included and integrated in society. Well, of course, there just are not the resources to support disabled children in the community in Moldova or in schools, so they do end up in the care of these institutions. How then are the Moldovan authorities going to make these schools more inclusive? În acest an vom ajusta circa 26 de școli din Republică This year, we will revamp 26 special schools in our Republic that need to become more friendly and accessible, as I'm afraid previously we didn't have the means to do it. Currently, there are training courses going on for teachers in such schools and specialized assistants. We're only just starting to do these things, I won't deny it, but let's not compare again today's situation with what we had seven, eight years ago. We've made progress in the Republic of Moldova. Well, that's Valentina Boliga of the Moldovan government. And there is information about Moldova and other countries which have these care institutions for children on our website. You can also go there to find out more about Joe Rowling's organisation, LUMOS. And it's also worth saying that you can hear the full interview with Joe Rowling. It's available online from 10.45 this morning. So on to another of her favourite topics, something she felt passionately needed to be included today, uh, shoes. Let's just hear one why she wanted to hear about shoes on this her woman's hour takeover shoes now mm. um i i defy well i suppose i can't generalize but because if, if i do say there isn't a woman alive who doesn't care about shoes we'll we'll get emails and letters from people who don't give up tell us off exactly. and tell us that there are far more important things in life than shoes and i agree there are definitely are more important things in life than shoes except to say that, that yes go on <laughs> I like shoes and I have often wondered in a vague way why why women are so pot- obsessed with this particular item of clothing and I think it is undeniable that probably shoes do come first in the most mythologized fetishized item list I'd say so I thought this was a great opportunity to investigate that and I also was thinking about how how often shoes turn up in stories and fairy tales. And again, why is that? So, yes, what is the power and myth of the shoe? And particularly the high-heeled shoe. Well, naturally, yes. I'm not a pumps girl. I'm not a sensible flats girl. Do you I mean, own any pumps? Well, I do own some flat boots because there does come a point where you really can't I mean it gets a little bit ridiculous you do need to be able to walk the dog and I do walk the dog and I don't do that in stilettos she asks the big questions I do do you own any pumps that's journalism for you uh, with me the fashion historian Caroline Cox and the shoe designer Georgina Goodman welcome to you both thank you for coming in so um Joe Rowling has a point Caroline fetishized mythologized why are shoes treated this way well, I think because they're our first contact with the ground. So there's a, you're, you're rooted by your shoes mm. and we all have to wear shoes. So there's a practical aspect, but there's also the sort of magical aspect. And I think when you look at the way that shoes appear in fairy tales, for instance, like, you know, Cinderella's glass slipper, um, there's a real difference between men in shoes in fairy tales and women. For men, they're powerful. You have your seven league boots. You can stride across the world. For women, they seem to be about an entry into sexual maturity, like the red shoes, for instance, where you have Karen who naughtily wears her red shoes to confirmation and she's punished spiritually by um, her shoes basically running away with her. She can't control them. She runs into the forest the deep and dark we all know forest. what happens in deep dark forests. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and the only way they can stop her uncontrolled sexuality in her naughty red shoes is to cut her feet off. Um, yeah, Georgina, um, <laughs> you and shoes, when did you first come to shoes? Um, well, there isn't really a time I can remember that I didn't absolutely love shoes. I mean, in 1978, my parents gave me a book, a Cinderella book. And I think from that point, really... I was very interested in in the power of shoes and I'd open my mum's wardrobe and I'd pay shoe shops and and then it wasn't until a lot later on that I realised that you could actually make a career out of making and 
selling shoes. I and just thought it was designing, about buying. Yes, designing thought, shoes, yeah, as, yeah. as you have done. But I, mean, I gather that, in fact, technology took quite some time to catch up with imagination where, where shoes were concerned, Caroline, because stilettos were being drawn, weren't they, before they could actually be made? Totally. I think that's what's you know, really interesting thing about the high heel. I mean, originally the high heel was worn by men and it was a way of keeping your foot in the stirrup when you were doing so hard where riding. Are we? What century is this then? We're in the 18th century. Um, by the end of the 19th century, the hair high heel is exclusively female and the higher the heel the sec- more sexual sexual it was you know recognized and when you look at um, early fetishistic imagery particularly illustrative imagery in the 1920s and 30s heels are spectacularly high but the technology wasn't there to achieve them it wasn't until the early 1950s that the metal spigot down the heel was developed so high heels could reach the height and the thinness that people actually wanted What really puzzles me, uh, Georgina, is that link between pain and stylish stroke sexy shoes. Why do women continue to put up with that? I think you know there's a you your pain levels go up so you can you, so, so, okay those are shoes I can wear for an hour those are shoes I can wear for two hours those are shoes I can wear for three so you you have your different shoes in your wardrobe for different reasons I mean there are some shoes you never wear and there are some shoes you only wear in the bedroom and the, the, you know, we've all got those in our wardrobe. I guess I just want to put uh, speak up for the comfortable shoe and the fact that men wouldn't put up with discomfort in this or any other sartorial department. Well, it takes a lot to break in a pair of bespoke shoes. Even the, you, when you have a pair of shoes made for you, a pair of bespoke, you've still got to break in that leather. There is a certain <laughs> amount of kind of blistering that has to happen oh, in order for you to break that shoe in. I mean, men, I men, do wear, men do wear high heels, but men wear high heels which have got connotations with, you know, kind of ruggedness, like the cowboy boot, Or for hidden instance. stacks. We'll have to, to leave it there. Uh, yes, well, we can't mention any names. <laughs> I'm sure we all know that the person we're thinking of. Um, thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Georgina, for coming in this morning. Uh, Mary tweets to say, I'm just starting to get properly into Radio 4. It's taken me a while. I'm learning to love it. Yes, I mean, it's like wearing in a you know, pair of shoes, as we just described. You really have to put the hours in. Um, thank you both very much for coming. Um, that's it then from the very first Woman's Hour takeover. Today, our editor was J.K. Rowling. There's much more from Joe online right now, which we just didn't have time to include in the programme today. Just search Woman's Hour takeover and J.K. Rowling, and you can find 30 minutes of J.K. Rowling talking about her desire to do good in the world and how that fed into the character of... Hermione, uh, plus reflections from her about the benefits of failure and being quite open actually about her insecurities and her life when she was a teenager. I look back at the very angst-ridden girl I was at 16 and I just wish I could have given myself a break. It's such a tough time. There's so much pressure on you from everyone to be something else. You need to find out who you are. And then as Dolly Parton famously said, do it on purpose. (laughs) Um, Joe, thank you very much for being our inaugural Woman's Hour Takeover guest editor. We really appreciate your time and uh, all the really interesting subjects you've covered uh, in the course of the programme. Tomorrow's guest editor is Kelly Holmes. Then we've got the novelist Naomi Alderman, Doreen Lawrence on Thursday and then Lauren Laverne on Friday. Um, So you've kick-started the whole thing brilliantly. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure and a real honour to be in such distinguished company. J.K. Rowling, go online if you want to hear the full interview with her. Now the drama Les Donne, set in modern-day Naples. Caterina Riccardi has discovered that her husband Franco is a key member of the Neapolitan Mafia. With Franco in prison awaiting trial, Caterina was forced to kill a rival to protect her son, but he too was killed. Now, with the help of Salvatore, her husband's closest adviser, she has to face the consequences. Episode 1 of Les Donne. 